<laughs> Did you remember what happened? Yes. yes. I hadn't decided. Yeah. And um, my, my, Mike Boland, my campaign manager, and I said we were going to decide on a Saturday. Mm -hmm. yep. And I came to, I think, a Thursday meeting here, and then the story leaked in the post, and then we were. <laughs> <laughs> so I hold you fully responsible. I, um, uh, I, I saw the announcement, just sort of vague, talking about New York corruption scandals and my recent research. Uh, or my research on, on my book. So I'm not actually entirely clear uh, which direction I should go in tonight. I think I'm going to be brief in my talks and then we can chat a little bit about uh, you know, things, that I, things that I see happening. I, um, I just finished, not, I just got tenure. Oh. Yay! Yay. So I can say what I really think. <laughs> um, and I'm actually thrilled. Fordham has been great. And one of the reasons I got tenure is this book I just finished called Corruption in America, um, which I got a $1,000 advance for. Yeah. <laughs> and ended up selling 10,000 copies. All right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, but the, the real thesis of the book, it was really a letter to the Supreme Court in a lot of ways. Um, I didn't, I was surprised that anybody read it besides the clerks, but it was really written for Justice Kennedy and Justice Roberts and Justice Scalia yeah. to say, I know, it was, it was more tilting at windmills than other things I've done. Um, but to say, if you're going to pretend to be originalists, you can't square that with Citizens United and a series of cases that you've had that have been striking down really powerful anti-corruption laws. So the book is a history of what uh, corruption has meant historically, with the first third focusing on the Constitutional Convention, where they talked about corruption almost the entire time. It was almost an obsession. Um, the big obsession at the time was the problem of placemen, people who went into elected office in order to get rich in some other means by some other means. Uh, the placemen they were worried about at the time was people, uh, what they saw in Britain, where people would go into elected office in order to get an appointment by the king. Um, so we want to talk about current scan corruption scandals in New York. <laughs> um, we do have, you know, nationally a problem, of, a modern problem of placemen, where people go into elected office in order to become very, uh, later very well-paid lobbyists over... 50% uh, of con Congress members now go into lobbying jobs, and it means they're serving their future masters while they're in Congress. But of course, the contemporary is beautiful. <laughs> the, you know, the, the New York analogy is the, the ser of serving two masters, placemen, is when we have people who go into elected office, um, and then uh, because of outside income, um, often uh, through law firms, um, often through legal clients, um, you see uh, representatives who are serving their clients and not serving their constituencies. Um, and that's broadly what, uh, you know, one of the things that we see in the Shelley Silver um, scandal. Uh -huh. um, the real fun part of the book, so the, the big meat of it is if you're going to be originalist, you've got to sort of take into account that the founders really saw um, corruption as the biggest threat to self-government. And the job of building a constitution to be protect, to make it less likely, there's always going to be corruption, but make it less likely that people who will go into public office will serve private interests instead of serve public interests. The, the way that would have made a difference in Citizens United is the Supreme Court said in Citizens United, there's a, a serious First Amendment issue when corporations spend money. That's political speech. I disagree with that also, but setting that aside. And... We can't justify limits on corporate spending by saying they do anything about corruption because corruption is only criminal quid, quid pro quo where there's an explicit exchange. So my fight with the, 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 um, the Supreme Court is then to say that's totally ahistorical. That's quid pro quo only entered the lexicon as part of bribery law in the 1970s, actually. Um, and uh, when the framers talked about corruption, they weren't talking about bribery because there were no criminal bribery laws that applied to lawmakers. There were criminal bribery laws that applied to judges, but the basic idea is if a lawmaker took a bribe, you unelected them. <laughs> In fact, there's a great story about the Georgia, uh, which basically gave away millions and millions of acres uh, in the Yazoo land scandal, because 50, uh, sorry, over all but one of the Georgia lawmakers had a, a stock interest in the land. Uh -huh. And Georgia, 
rose up and kicked them all out of office. Yay! <laughs> And then had a bonfire and burned the law, <laughs> giving away the, uh, uh, the, the uh, land. There was still a contract law question about whether the, uh, that contract was still valid and um, between the state and the private land companies. The Supreme Court, I promise I won't talk too much law, we can talk, but I'll tell you this much. It was great, uh, a great case in terms of um, being the only Supreme Court case that I know about in which one of the lawyers had to take time off to sober up. <laughs> uh, we're coming back. Um, the, case, uh, the case was, you know, can we impair this contract between the state and these uh, land companies which got this land for pennies on the dollar? Justice Marshall, who himself had been a land speculator, said, ah, you know, we can't invalidate this law just because it was corruptly passed, because how do we know which laws are corruptly passed and which ones aren't? Oh, really interesting uh, legal issue. Uh, probably my favorite part of the book and the history um, is the, the lobbying history, because for about 100 years in American law, um, lobbying was against the public policy of the United States. It was a felony in Georgia. A uh, felony in California, Yay. and uh, but for the most part, they weren't enforcing law, uh, criminal criminal. They weren't using criminal laws to prosecute corruption anyway. The criminal laws were just a much smaller part of our society. Um, so the way in which the lobbying was disfavored was through contract law. There are certain kinds of things you can't sell, like you can't sell in most states. You can't sell sex. So if there's a contract for sex and then one person bails out, you can't go to court and try to enforce that contract. Is that called you can't marriage? sell organs for the most part. <laughs> um, in New York City, you can't sell metro cards. Um, so that if you go say, I've, we've made a deal and we go to court to enforce it, the court will say that's just not a sellable, not a vendable thing. Well, lobbying was not a vendable thing. It was something you could bring your own personal influence, but you couldn't sell it. So um, the, the great case about this is a um, Supreme Court case where an old man uh, uh, goes to hire, he's too old to go to Washington himself, he's owed thousands of dollars, so he hires a Boston lawyer, the Boston lawyer goes to Washington, he um, talks to congressmen, members, writes letters, has private meetings, and gets the old man's thousands of dollars back and then uh, says, now pay me for my services of helping you out. And the old man says, I'm not going to pay you. That was a corrupt contract to lobby. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it goes all the way up to the Supreme Court. Should you enforce this contract? And the court says, well, you know, um, I mean, the big fear was that lobbyists would then themselves take their money and then bribe lawmakers, right? Mm. But there was no evidence in this case of the lobbyists uh, bribing anybody. So, uh, the, but the court said, if we allow this instance, if we enforce this contract, well then the great corporations of our day will hire adventurers <laughs> <laughs> to make their case um, in, in these state houses. And every right-thinking man would call that corrupt. Um, so I actually don't think we should, you know, make lobbying illegal again, but it's, I, I, I found it really fascinating to look at our history to see different ways in which we've thought about um, some of the, you know, real threats to self-government as they've come along. Um, and then, of course, in 1976 with Buckley versus Vallejo, which is the first case to strike down uh, the anti-corruption laws uh, limiting uh, campaign spending, you see a real shift in the courts. But really for the first 200 years, you see a consistent sense that the job of the courts is to protect against this existential threat of corruption. And obviously I think we have an existential threat of corruption <laughs> right now. So um, thanks for your patience with a little law school uh, <laughs> book telling. I'll, I'll tell you what I've been up to recently and then I'd love to chat and hear what what you guys think are the key issues. I, I'm sorry that I missed the first uh, 20 minutes because I would have loved to sort of listen in a little bit on, on what you see happening. Um, besides teaching, I've been doing, I've done about 12, and I'm going to do some more events around the state with Josh Fox. Yay, <laughs> yay. Uh, who uh, you may know as yeah. uh, um, uh, director of Gasland and Gasland 2. Um, a real, and also a wonderful organizer. <laughs> 
Um, so he and I and some musicians and um, somebody who knows a lot about renewable energy um, have been doing events where we talk uh, about how we can have 100% renewable energy, energy future. Very practically. Like how you can switch your source of energy, how Germany has moved su such that last year um, there's a day in which 75% of Germany's electricity needs were met by solar alone. Wow. Um, you know, to really sort of create the sense of a real possibility mm. of what we can do. And I, I've been focused on that. We're honing the presentation. Um, if you guys would ever want us to come, I'm sure we'd love to come here. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, um, I think it would be a lot of fun. We have some singing. Uh, it's like a, a idol singing. <laughs> Bethany Yarrow, who's Peter Yarrow's uh -huh. uh, da yes. daughter, is a beautiful singer. She's, she often sings with us. So anyway, that's something we might, uh, if you guys want to oh, see absolutely. it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, we'll do it in the church. What? We'll do it in the church. Oh, yeah. Um, so I've been that doing that, and then I worked a little bit, although I was just a foot soldier on the net neutrality fight, mm -hmm. um, which I take as one of the, you know, along with banning fracking, one of the most improbable <laughs> recent successes where the head of the FCC announced we're having net neutrality in the United States. It's still a fight, I mean, believe me. But this is somebody who himself had been a cable company a lobbyist. And uh, if you just did a power map, you'd say, there's no way we're going to have net neutrality. But uh, four million people put in mm -hmm. comments to the FCC, mm -hmm. which is sort of 5% of the number of people who voted in the 2014 <laughs> fall election. So you have people commenting to a regulatory agency they've barely heard of. Um, and then actually a lot of bird dogging, um, you know, uh, at, at, along as we saw with the fracking fight. And I just think it's so exciting because as many of you know, I'm all about trust busting. And um, taking, you know, showing that we can take on big cable is the beginning of showing that we can take on other, other industries. Um, and then I'm thinking about working on a book. Um, I was trying not to be too um, mean-spirited during this budget fight. <laughs> so I did not get involved in every part of it. The one part that I you know, tried to help out on a little bit was um, education and education funding. Um, and um, the parents and teachers, education funding, and then also uh, resisting this onslaught of um, high stakes testing, where teachers get evaluated through testing. Um, the, uh, we didn't win. Um, <laughs> it's not over. It's not over. Well, it's not over. It's very far from over. And there's a very powerful opt-out movement. Um, right. That, uh, That's what I spoke about in my district report, which you missed. Oh, oh yes. But exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, and it was not good from Albany, but we opt out. But, but, you know, so it's, I, I hate this sort of you know, the false optimism that we can sometimes have where we say we, we lost but we had a good fight. But I will say that the grassroots energy of parents and teachers and community members around education has been unbelievable. And watching the numbers flip where people really were like, I don't trust Cuomo on education and I really trust uh, teachers more. Um, uh, my favorite was when Brian Lair on WNYC asked Karen DeWitt, who does he think his constituency is for high stakes testing? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't that tone. It was more like, who does he think it is? But, but you know, it, it really became clear, I think, to more and more people that his constituency was a handful of hedge fund owners. Um, and uh, there's this group called the Hedge Clippers, which has been coming out with white papers on hedge fund owners really trying to buy right. New York That's policy. Right. That's right. But there were five, I mean, you probably might have talked about this, there were 500 schools that had events about six weeks ago. Um, there were 75 forums around the state where people were learning, you know, educational organizing forums. And, um, and then in a brilliant, devious move, the um, uh, Tish, Meryl Tish, has said, we are going to exempt the high-performing di districts from um, the high-stakes testing, some of the high-stakes testing. This is like getting rid of the draft for the rich people. Yeah. <laughs> you know? It's, it's just, it's, I, when I saw it, I was like, Oh, it's because I so much. I really not know that, that that sticks out like a sore thumb, that that's what it is. And I know, I know. That it feels like that's all that it is, right? Because there's been a lot of protesting on Long Island, Westchester, mm -hmm. and so if you take some of that energy out, and also those are people who are more likely to donate, 
Um, so I'm hoping that, I mean, I don't think that's going to take the air out, but if this is a battle royale for education. Um, and we, we probably did get, you know, 0 0.3 billion more um, than, than we would, you know, than what Cuomo had initially proposed. Um, he proposed 1.1 billion, uh, Hasty proposed 1.7. Um, uh, I can talk about what I think about, I mean, I, I haven't met Hasty. I'd like to, you know, I will eventually, but um, I do think what we see is a little more air in the assembly, um, just a sense that more uh, other people in the assembly can have power, and that's exciting. Um, you know, not formally, but informally, the reports are that he's listening, he'll have conference meetings, say, you know, take the temperature of the caucus. And that means that, you know, actually influencing your, you know, really putting pressure on your assembly numbers, which I know you guys do anyway, is, um, can have even more meaning than when you're under a silver regime where things are just, just locked down. Um, so my own inclination is to, you know, I'll, I'll always openly disagree with Hasty if I disagree with him, but to really try to support him in what he's doing and building power and uh, both more distributed power in the assembly and then at least, you know, he was standing up and speaking out for teachers and rejecting the governor publicly, which I think is valuable in and of itself. Um, there's some things that I haven't been involved in, been doing, but I want to do, uh, which is really, really think about uh, 2016 Democratic Senate. Because um, no matter what we do, without a Democratic Senate, um, uh, you, you, no matter who the governor is, without a Democratic Senate, we're, we're in a... a tough place, okay? So we should be able to get a Democratic Senate. Uh, have you guys talked about this? Not yet. Okay, you should be able to get a Democratic Senate because um, it's a presidential year. So we had, you know, radically low turnout this past year. And uh, in a presidential year in New York State, you're going to expect a lot more Democrats uh, to come out. And so in those close districts, we should be able to actually win uh, we should be able to win a foolproof Democratic Senate. Um, so that means to me a few things. One is starting to lay the groundwork to make sure that we support that happening. It's not as glamorous as you know, gubernatorial races, but it's really important. And the other is working with our existing lawmakers to be ready to lead. Because the Democrats aren't used to leading in Albany. <laughs> no, I mean, um, so to, you know, if you actually have a Democratic Senate and a Democratic Assembly um, and a Democratic Governor, um, you have you have just the entire scope of possibility changes. So, what are the priorities that you want your lawmakers to have? You know, what are the, what does that first two years look like, 2016 to 2018? Um, how, do they hear now? You know, for me, one of the key things is always going to be public financing of elections. Mm -hmm. Majority of Democrats, not majority, Democrats all say they're in favor of public financing of elections. No, no, no. Uh, a lot of that is soft. That's right. Because mm. it's easy to say yeah. uh, when you know you can't get it. So working, and, and also they don't hear from their constituents too much about it. They hear from their constituents about rent or upstate property taxes and education. But they're not getting people here, they're not hearing it's a real problem that you're not being a leader on public financing elections. So I, the one of the things I'd like to, um, in the next couple of years, focus on is you know meeting with all of those leaders, but also encouraging others to to say this has to be a priority once we get in power. Um, so that's where I am, and I'd love to hear thoughts or questions or hi. hi. Do you think that uh, state? elected prosecutors and the state attorney general are doing enough when it comes to prosecuting the state's highest elected officials. Um, is it a matter, as the attorney general maintains, that the laws have to be changed? Or is it realistic to think that state prosecutors and state officials can ever go after the three men in the room, given their closeness to uh, state officials, unlike the U.S. attorneys? Yeah, I mean, um, I can give you one specific example where I don't think we went far enough. Um, the one, you know, the one that I've looked into. Um, but in general, I think we could be more aggressive. 
Uh, and the specific example is just the Moore Lodge Commission. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, as you may recall, the uh, and then, uh, recognizing this is a politically tricky situation, but um, I've been pretty consistent on this, um, is that, as you may recall, the Attorney General actually had to be um, given authority in our so-called Moreland Commission, it's half Moreland and then half uh, executive order, and I forget the order name, uh, an executive order giving uh, the Attorney General authority to then deputize assistant Attorney Generals who then had the authority to investigate the legislative branch, right? So that was never dissolved. That authority was given and never dissolved. And that's an instance where I would have loved to see the Attorney General continue to use that authority and force the governor to dissolve it so there would be more, you know, a, a clear statement of, uh, you know, I'm, I, he, he still has the authority to do that. So that's one instance. And yeah, I mean, but I, I'd have to really get into the facts of particular cases to say, here's where I'd like to see more. But impressionistically, I think we could see more. And I don't like relying on the federal prosecutor. <laughs> Um, thank you for coming. Sure. Thank you for running. Sure. And thank you for staying visible. <laughs> and thank you for getting tenure. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm just going to sit here so I can see who's raising their hand. Okay. And you're, you're, you're the, video everything, so you might as well be on the um, <laughs> Because the media doesn't always cover you properly. Mm -hmm. uh, two things. One is Indian Point, which is operating on a, uh, mm. without a license. Yeah. Um, and the other is, there's a recent documentary called the, the, the uh, peace, peace Officer, which is about a sheriff, it's a militarization of, 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 the, of the police forces across the country. Yeah. But in it, the featured sort of character is an ex-sheriff in Utah. What's it who, called? Peace Keeper. Uh -huh. And this ex-sheriff ran against Orrin Hatch. Mm -hmm. um, Orrin Hatch ra never had someone run against him before. Raised 50, Hatch raised $56 million. Yeah. The sheriff spent $15,000. Mm -hmm. Lost, but he got something passed in the state, um, which was that no bill could be introduced that had other elements in it that was not in its title. Yeah. And I'd like, to, if you were familiar with that, and if you could talk about how that would really help this quagmire in D.C., and let alone in the state. Uh, yeah. is, that a, is that something we should fight for? That's a great question. Um, uh, you know, I'm opposed to Indian points. So that's easy. <laughs> but uh, the, in general, what you do see is this sort of uh, manipulation of the process in all these ways. If you had to have every bill, I, I just have to look at the details of the bill. Uh, but in New York State, of course, we have a problem of excessive executive power in the budget itself. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the key problem here. Um, it's not the unaffiliated, um, I mean, and then Andrew Cuomo putting together unaffiliated packages of this is what I'm going to push through. But that, his capacity to do that flows from his executive power. Um, and, oh, one thing I think is really important, <sighs> which relates to this, I want to blow up the idea that an on-time budget makes it a good budget. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and that's something that we, should, we just have to train the press. Because right now, they'll, you know, they'll lead stories saying, well, it's his fifth on-time budget. I talk about low expectations. <laughs> you know? I think that's the point. Yeah, no, right. It's like he sets his bar so low, and it's like, oh, my God, I got that one. <laughs> But if we did not, ex I mean, look, I, I'm not opposed to having a long time budget. It's not terrible. But it is nothing compared to the content of the budget. So the problem is that, you know, what I, I was, I wanted to do, but I didn't really organize around it. I was just sort of tweeting about it, <laughs> you know, sent out maybe one email about it, is to set the expectation that we, that Hasty should, should be able to resist the April 1st deadline. And that it wouldn't be, you know, then the assembly wouldn't take the blame for a late budget and the chaos or disaster. It would just be a better, better situation because that allows for these kinds of tying that you're talking about. This does relate to your question. <laughs> anyway, getting uh, sort of moving past this on-time budget fetish, which only increases executive power. That's what it's doing right now. Okay. It, end of your point? Um, yeah, no, I'm against it. We should, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> that, that's easy. And I, 
but, but I guess what I would say, and what Josh and I are always saying about fracking, um, and, but the same is true for uh, nuclear, is that uh, we are not banning fracking until we actually move to a renewable energy source. Because we're still getting it from <laughs> Pennsylvania. And uh, we're not stopping this kind of resource until we actually replace it. So that's part of the reason we want to move aggressively towards you know, supporting uh, solar geothermal. Geothermal is really exciting for New York City. Um, I, maybe I should, uh, if you guys haven't, have somebody come in and talk about geothermal in New York. Um, there's a great a new report suggesting that you can uh, provide a lot of the energy in New York. It's one of the good things NYU finally did. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we had some okay, questions sorry. from here before. Yeah. Um, Sharon, then John, then Peter. Yeah. Okay. Um, I and I will remind you, please, a question in the form of a question, and please, one minute. Um, so I've been writing about an issue for the last few years, and um, so I'm wondering what your thoughts are about the mom and pop stores closing yeah. and the government's response or lack of response to the prices. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I think of this sometimes as the $30,000 question. Like, where do you get a loan if you need $30,000 to renovate your bathroom or to put up a new awning? And we actually, it means relates to this, is we, that, that kind of credit is essential for a mom and pop economy. Is the capacity to make, to, uh, make the, get these small uh, uh, lines of credit. And there's nowhere you can get it right now. Big banks don't <laughs> lend under um, $200,000, $250,000. <coughs> And um, the uh, SBA seems to be broken, although some of you really want to look into it, the Small Business Association. But, I all, but the other part of the mom and pop story is antitrust, actually. You know, the ways in which we are subsidizing big businesses, which makes it impossible for mom and pop stores to um, compete. So um, I would love to hear your thoughts about it. If you send me a link to your blog, I'd love to see it. But um, we've seen a rapid decline in small businesses really since um, the mid-'80s. Um, and uh, the Republicans often use the rhetoric of small business, but they, their policies don't support small business. And I actually think the Democrats don't do nearly enough to um, really listen to the concerns of small business owners and the way in which they're disproportionately affected by uh, some regulations. So I think, uh, and I think that's a democratic crisis as well as an economic crisis because uh, a good democracy relies on a kind of small business economy. But I'd love to see your blog because uh, it's sort of a passion. Uh, hi, Zach. I want to thank you also for coming here and for the uh, courageous political example that you've set in the country uh, that, that reverberates outside of New York as well. Um, as an educator, I also am curious about like, all this talk about education. I think I'm wondering what your thoughts are on this about the connection between democracy and education. I also got a good liberal arts education at Fordham. Uh -huh. uh, I got a BA in English there, and I went to NYU for a master's in education. And it seems like there's a linkage between the ability to think critically yeah. and to hold accountable the corporate sector. And I think that's being dumbed down. And at the same time, you have like, what you're fighting against Citizen United, yeah. is the corporate, almost like a corporate coup in the, in the political sphere. So, that, But the citizenry is not equipped to think about it because of the lack of critical thinking in the schools. So I'm wondering yeah. what your thoughts are on that. And then very quickly, Elizabeth Warren has spoken in New York today. Uh -huh. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are about that. And in fact, what is our responsibility yeah. as progressives yeah. to encourage such a candidacy that would make a serious difference, even if, you know, if she's not electable or whatever, but she could put pressure on Hillary to also move in a progressive direction. Yeah. So I, I completely agree with your first point, and um, I actually, so I want to write about this and really figure out how to talk about it, but I think this fight about education is a fight about what a person is. You know, like, is a person, and so that's also a little bit of a fight that we're having in, you know, across the board in all these different areas. And so much of the vision of the person in the, in the reformers, privatization, is this very narrow vision, both of teachers, the teachers are motivated by pay, and that, uh, and that kids are just these like input-output things as opposed to emotional, creative, complicated, mm -hmm. curious. You know, curiosity sort of doesn't even fit in the language of the privatizers. Mm -hmm. And then if, but that fight then reflects also what a citizen is. And so we've had this fight about what a person is in different arenas, like in 
you know, what race are you? Are you a person? Well, are, are women people? You know, what is, who like gets to have the full benefits of being a full, complete, curious, complicated person? And I think under the privatizing scheme, it's like the elites do with the private school mm -hmm. scheme, but not the public education. And that has huge effects on then critical thinking and creativity and hope. And, yeah. And um, so I would love it if Elizabeth Warren ran. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I, I happen to think that Hillary Clinton is um, a, a sort of a proven bad candidate. <laughs> um, so, so there's a, something a little JV about us putting up somebody who has not actually had a tough race um, as our democratic standard bearer. Um, and I don't think people change that much, so the number of handlers doesn't actually like, make you a good candidate. That doesn't mean she's not a good manager, but she just isn't, hasn't shown herself to be very fluid as a candidate. Um, I also tend to disagree with her on a bunch of policies. Um, and so I'd, I'd like to see a primary for a bunch of different reasons. Um, I also think she should want a primary because right now she's designed this brilliant system where the best reporters in the country get the job following the top mm -hmm. candidate, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's no horse race, right? So what do those reporters do? They just train their sights on that candidate right. for 15 months uh -huh. and destroy her. Uh -huh. So she should want a primary, right? So that the, there's something else to talk about. So um, anyway, I hope O'Malley runs. Uh, you know, O'Malley sounds interesting to me. Um, Sanders. We have, what? Sanders. Sanders, will, yeah. Um, Joe Biden, I want a real race. So, um, so uh, I'm, I'm personally very excited about, I'm going to an event, um, you know, I'm a little old fashioned where I'm not going to endorse somebody until they announce, but um, I'm going to an event encouraging Warren to run, and um, yeah, I, I, think, I, I think it's terrific, all the energy around Warren, but then also other candidates, so. Um, Peter, look, and then I'm going to go to the other side, uh, Alec, and... Uh, Josh. Hi, congratulations on tenure. <laughs> Thank that's, you. That's a valuable part of your life, I assume. <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, I had a wonderful conversation with my best friend who's living out in Colorado these days. And, uh, that's crazy. I got him involved in politics through uh, mm -hmm. this monthly mm -hmm. salon that's called right. Punto that happens in Midtown Good. and it's supported by Victor Nudo Hopper. And they have a very strongly libertarian thing. And because I got him involved with the Punto, he became a libertarian and he actually ran uh, uh, for the 8th uh, District uh, Congress position against Nago. A feudal exercise, obviously, against somebody that's been doing all this stuff for many years. We had about an hour, hour long conversation of what, where he's leaning for 2016, and he actually has a poster supporting the libertarian candidate. I think his name is Gary Johnson. Uh, out, out in front of the rancho with a view of Pikes Peak, 8,000 feet. And we had this conversation about what we thought was going to happen in 2016. And we went through all the candidates, and I, I presented my choices to him, and he sort of articulated your choices. And uh, who I want to run is Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> and there you go, 100 million votes right out, right out of the box. And it just changed the parameters of uh, the Question. vice presidency and how what, what, what I think would be a star chamber with 12 people as vice presidential candidates. So, uh, 2016, where are you leading? Uh, well, I think I just answered before. I'd like yeah. to see a lot of people in the race, uh, but I, I'll just say one add-on thing is that, you know, I may be very disappointed. Maybe that Hillary Clinton is our only candidate. And uh, um, that, for me, what that's going to mean is just throwing a lot of my energy in other places. Cause there's a lot of other places to work. Um, and which is, you guys know better than anybody because you're, you're working them. But that, uh, it, you know, our, our dreams may not come true in terms of having a... Um, a truly contested primary, that doesn't mean we're, we're done with the political work we need to do. Alan? Hi, um, I heard you speak once before about um, the effect of club endorsements when you were running. Oh my gosh, you're and, so uh, we spend a, you know, we've spent a lot of time in the past on a lot of fights over who's to endorse for what, and, yeah. and we'll be doing this in the future. <laughs> and just to give us a little feedback as to how useful the endorsements are beyond the boundaries of the West Village, what, yeah. uh, how you took the endorsements from down here upstate. It, well, it, makes, it made a huge difference for, uh, you know, there's the incremental difference when you say talk to the Sierra Club. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and so nobody wants to be the first to be out on a limb, except apparently you guys. <laughs> but, um, but just have it, you know, so, so it'll, it, it certainly helped talking to the Sierra Club, helped talking to NOW, um, PEF, which were sort of the big institutional endorsements that I had. And then also, I think it makes the biggest difference in races like mine, where there isn't a lot of um, money or expectation. Because people are often looking for just some signal that you're not completely crazy. <laughs> right? And so, like, I so, give that signal. I wear pearls. <laughs> no, but, but that's what the endorsement gives is that it's sort of like, okay, that's enough for me to want to look a little deeper. Because if you don't have that, so even, even if they don't know a lot about your club, it's a signal that there's there's something serious there. So, so it might be a good thing, otherwise they say, oh, that's just <laughs> no, no, no. But the other the other uh, function of it, which I didn't talk about, um, is that it, uh, it, you guys ask tough questions, <laughs> um, and uh, it, I know it made me a better candidate because I didn't answer them fully the first time, but I was more <laughs> prepared the second time, and then it also obviously affects what I think about. It. And you have the capacity by asking tough questions to, you know, focus candidates. Um, so that I think that helps too. Thank you, Josh, and then Frida. Uh, thank you again for coming. Sure. Uh, I think it's going to be an easy question for you, but I was just curious as to how you found that your life has changed at Fordham specifically since you ran. Have your students been like any different than they were previously? I got more people to sign up for a class <laughs> called Market Structure and Democracy. <laughs> 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 well, I went to Fordham too, just to yeah. <laughs> yeah, my, um, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the biggest, the, the, the faculty has been really great, and I didn't know what to expect, but they've been sort of excited that I might be connected to some political opportunities, you know, so I have a colleague who's really interested in the Garner um, sealed mm. indictment. Uh, who focuses on criminal law, and he usually, I think, thinks about uh, just writing for his colleagues. And now he's like, okay, there's other people I can share these ideas with, and I hope that that's an influence among colleagues. I mean, other people work outside of the school, too, so I'm not the only one, but that's nice. And then the students, um, yeah, I have uh, more students come by who want to get involved in politics. Mm. Mm. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I really like Fordham. It's been good to me. Rita and then Eli. Um. First Oops, of all, there's like so many. <laughs> um, over here. I did. I started over here. Okay, Irene and then Tom. I just wanted to tell you, for your information, we as a club did not support Hillary's second run for the Senate. We headquartered Jonathan Tosini in our clubhouse. That's, right. that's, that's, right. Right. <laughs> that's yeah, one bit of information uh, to yeah. tell you. So. We're not huge Hillary fans. Yes. Uh, that's one thing. Brad Hoylman was here last month and talked to us about the budgeting process. Yeah. And the thing that stuck with me and has bothered me for the entire month was his statement that the progressive part of the Senate was not included in the caucus at all. However, the five dissidents from the Democratic Party were a seat at the table, yeah. and the progressive part was not. Yes. And therefore, the hope for a decent budget was yeah. killed to begin with. Yeah, I think I think that's absolutely right, and uh, that flows from Cuomo. Um, and all I mean, what we can do is just continue to support. One of the things I think about is. Uh, do you remember or do you ever think, you know, the, the great progressive senators in the uh, 1910s? <laughs> uh, the sort of yes. gang of five. I might. <laughs> the gang of five, and then like the, the five or six senators, you know, that, that are individual, you know, Elizabeth Warren alone is great, but I actually want us to see her as connected to Al Franklin and Merkley and Sherrod Brown. So it's not Warren, yes. it's that there is a populist force. And so we can, even in our description and figuring out how to do that in New York State, really describe and encourage the, the community of the progressive force within our, yeah. within our Senate and just make them louder and stronger so it's more and more offensive every time. But you're right, it was uh, born broken. Yeah.
Okay, Eli, yeah. and then Tom, and then Cormac, and then we have to call it because our next speaker is here. Yeah, I just wondered, if you go back to what you started with, the bribery, corruption, yeah. split, do you think that um, interpretation of play <coughs> into the government <coughs> and also the silver trial? I'm really curious about, because, you know, if there's no true proof that yes. there was a quid pro quo, I don't, you know, I, I'm So I am, I am actually wildly hopeful about the Menendez trial. Okay. Um, so, I think so big and obvious? Or the Menendez it? trial might be the crack that actually gets to Justice Kennedy. <laughs> because it's a super PAC, and Kennedy says in Citizens United, outside independent spending is not corrupting, <laughs> as a matter of law, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. But... He's thinking about a Hillary Clinton documentary at the time. He's not like he's a very um, he's, a, he's not an app, he, he sort of deals with different problems in different ways. He's not always consistent, and um, he does think of himself as a First Amendment warrior, which makes it hard. But in this case, there's a witness. We think the witness is the chief of staff. So if there is a witness, if this is true that there's a witness who's the chief of staff who's saying outside spending was directly leading to easy to follow policy changes, mm -hmm. then, then if that goes all the way up to the Supreme <clears throat> Court, that you could actually see something saying, well, super PACs can be corrupting, which then, or, or uh, corporate spending can be corrupting, and that would actually be a really powerful limitation on Citizens United. So I'm not saying it's going to happen, but yeah. that's what I'm hopeful. <laughs> but I think you need the witness. Yeah. I think yeah. the witness is going to be key to, to convince it's really hard to win bribery trials. Yeah, I, I, that's yeah. why I was very Yeah, confident. and he's going to use the speech and debate clause as a defense, too, which is a sort of another protection. Um, and then the silver trial, um, I assume that there will be some First Amendment defense, just because there always is going to be in any serious, uh, well-funded uh, uh, bribery uh, defense. But I don't think that's going uh, my, to... My sense is that trial is... Um, is not going to rise to the level of sort of constitutional uh, mm -hmm. interest. I forgot about Irene and then Tom. Oh, sorry, Tom. Um, this is back to education for a minute. Yeah. It's a very tricky thing to deal with because the candidate to address the press can be skewed so badly so easily. There, you may know that in the news this year there's talk about um, lowering the standards for the specialized public high schools yeah. to allow for greater diversity yeah. from low income neighborhoods and yeah. everything else. What that doesn't address, that looks good in the press mm -hmm. for a politician to be able to say, see what we've done? These kids now have this opportunity. It doesn't address two very important things. Those kids may well get there without the foundation that they need, and they're going to get to that school and struggle, and what can we do with their self esteem? Is them yeah. and really could scar them as well as ruin chances for colleges because their performance won't be that good. Mm -hmm. Because they do have the underpinnings. What we don't hear discussed instead or in addition to yeah. is if they're going to do that, then those kids, you owe it to them to give them summer support mm -hmm. for two summers prior. Like maybe the admissions for those kids. Irene, you, you got beat for one minute. I did. Uh, that was that. Um, no, but that's weird. The big question is, I'm sorry, so the other piece of that is, is there a way to get people to understand that those neighborhoods need the support at a young age so that they can achieve and walk into those schools with their heads held high, not feeling like someone did them a favor, but because they have the foundation they need and so that they're confident when they get there. Yeah. What can we do to move the conversation in that direction? Yeah, I mean, the specialized school thing is a, is a separate question because I totally disagree with you on the second part. The first part, I am I'm genuinely perplexed about what, how to deal with that. So I, I, like, I, I, I like hearing your thoughts on it because um, you know, I've just been reading about it. And then, uh, obviously, you know, a lot of people take advantage or who use a specialized school. That's a good example. Um, but I think the, the key, of course, is just raising the, the fundamental is not about specialized schools. The fundamental job is about all our schools. Right, exactly. Um, so, but, but how, how to get people to care about it? Uh, I'm trying. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, I really am heartened by this parent-teacher movement. It's a real movement. 
Um, and I'm, I'm She's very much part of it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay, Tom, you got it. Yeah, you mentioned Sheldon Silver earlier. Yeah. And what I was thinking was, uh, all of the, the Democrats that are there work very comfortably with him. Yeah. And when you ran in the primary, it was because of a lot of different reasons. And my feeling is, we have these same assembly people, state senators, that have been there forever, and they're gerrymandered in, and they, they went right along with Silver all those years. How can we expect change unless there's a real movement to get rid of them? Um, well, I, I, I believe in primaries, as you might know. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I think, I guess this sort of relates to the discussion earlier. Is I actually think one of the keys is supporting, you know, there's handfuls of amazing people in Albany, and supporting them mm. um, and giving them more power will then draw more people in. Also, they'll want to be part of Albany. And they'll want to run instead of thinking this is sort of a, a deadly and vaguely corrupt um, system. So uh, I, you know, I, I, I think there's, a, I actually think there's enough fresh blood that to that, that we, if we support those people, they can do amazing things. But um, you know, the more primaries, the better. Mm -hmm. Even for people that we like, I don't think of you know the primary I ran was against somebody who I, I deeply disagreed with on almost everything, but. Um, but I'm not opposed to people running very cordial primaries with some with people that they largely agree with, but think they could do a better job on a few things. And I don't think we should think of a primary as an insult, um, but rather just an exercise of democratic uh, power. Has the governor ever spoken to you? Uh, yeah, we had a brief conversation um, the, when I conceded. <laughs> <laughs>